My name is Richard and I'm an alcoholic. I'm also a drunk. Thanks be to God who leads us in his trial. Thanks be to God who's got the victory. Thanks be to God who leads us in his trial. Shout unto the nations, He's coming back. Whoa, He's coming back. Thanks be to God. Hi, my name is Richard, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'm also a drug addict, and uh, many other anything that I, a person could be addicted to, uh, you can put my name in it. Um, as I've gotten older, uh, my friend Jim and I decided that as I see the end approaching, uh, not that I'm going to die tomorrow, but uh, I just feel like I need to put my testimony down on uh, some kind of mode that will outlast me. Uh, because what God did in my life, what my higher power accomplished uh, is amazing and I want the world to know about it. I'm going to continue to give my testimony as often as I as I can, but uh, through uh, this uh, my testimony will outlast me and I, I certainly want it to. Uh, I want to start at the beginning. Uh, start when I, I was uh, I was born at a very young age, like many of you. <laughs> you could probably cut that out too. But I was born in western Nebraska. I actually was born in, across the border in Casper, Wyoming, but lived most of my young life in western Nebraska. And uh, my parents, uh, whatever there was from the paratroopers being there, and wash glasses and carry out empty bottles and <clears throat> all the things that that were necessary to make it suitable on Monday night to start all over again. But, and we began uh, totally unsupervised after the first couple of times that the par our parents told us what they wanted us to do. Uh, as we go down there, unlock, first thing we would do would be open up a beer. I was about 11. My brother was 13, I believe, and uh, we'd drink a beer while we were working, and then we'd drink another beer. And then finally we decided that uh, maybe we should take something home. So we'd take half pint bottles and, and take a little bit of, of whiskey or brandy or vodka or gin or whatever was open on the back bar and put in a half pint bottle or two and we'd take those home. And during the week then, every every evening we'd get buzzed. So I suppose by the time I was 13 or 14 I was a uh, alcoholic. And uh, I remember when each week when we'd run out of, of something to drink about Friday or Saturday I'd Next week we got to get more. Next week we got to get more, and that that just continued. Finally, when I was f 15, uh, my parents divorced, and they left. Uh, they sold the officers' club. Uh, I believe the war was over. They uh, split up and went their own ways. My mother went to New Mexico. My father went to Oregon. And uh, I got a job and stayed in Alliance, Nebraska. <clears throat> I quit school, I went to work. I worked uh, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 
and I made three dollars a day, which was a great salary in those days. I, I, if I remember right, I made twenty-one dollars a week with no taxes or anything taken out, and I, it was all cash, and I paid uh, eight dollars a week for a room, so I had plenty of money to live on and eat on. But it didn't leave an awful lot of money for for drinking, so for a period uh, in my life there I quit drinking. And I found that I was able to do that all through my life, that I'd be able to not drink for as much as uh, two or three years, but then eventually uh, the monster was still there and I would start all over again uh, and usually start with a binge and it would end with uh, uh, three or four months of fighting and arguing with my wife and and then I'd say I'm gonna quit and I'd quit uh, again for a period of time. My wife was very active in the church all of her life. Uh, she is today and and always was just a, a sweet lady uh, and I I was uh, a rounder. I got into everything I could get into and uh, when I did come home she knew that the police would be bringing me home or uh, that I was either in a hospital or uh, she'd call the police and uh, go down and get me and then make excuses for me at work and uh, when I wasn't at work. so. Uh, that was the way our life went. Uh, when I was 25, we moved to California. And I moved out here. Uh, to, uh, specifically, I wanted to be where the, where the printing was. I was working at that time in a newspaper and as a printer. And I uh, came to California. The pay was much better. We settled in uh, uh, San Pablo. I worked for the Richmond Independent for about four years and, and through my life uh, I've never held a job for longer than four, four years. So I worked there for four years and then I went to, to uh, the Martinez News Gazette and I worked there for a couple of years and I worked at the Oakland Tribune for three or four years and I worked at the, the Antioch Ledger, all the newspapers in the area. I'd work at for three or four years. But my goal, the reason that I came to California, and my goal always was to have my own printing firm and, and print art posters, artsy uh, posters. And so eventually I found a print shop for sale in, uh, in the quiet residential city of Berserkley, California. And this was in the uh, late 60s, early 70s when I had my shop there in the 70s. And uh, um, it was really the, at that time when I was over there, it was the drug capital of the world. You could buy anything on the street. Um, you didn't have to shop for it was readily available and I knew absolutely nothing about drugs and never, never, had never smoked marijuana. I heard a lot about it. And I noticed a terrible smell on uh, Durant Street. <laughs> so you'd go down Durant and <laughs> boy, somebody's cooking something terrible. But it was just always just the uh, uh, marijuana smoke that, that hung over the area and that you could get you could get high just by uh, going out for lunch and not smoking anything, just breathing the air. So uh, the drug culture was really in control there. And I bought the print shop and I began to cultivate uh, relationships with artists who were doing posters. And I uh, finally got uh, in with the buyer at the University of California. And I did a lot of posters for them, and through that, uh, I got my first really big account, and 
that was Bill Graham. Uh, he had a place in San Francisco that he called Winterland, and every week there'd be a concert there, and every week uh, th thousands of flyers actually and posters for the band. Uh, we usually printed. Uh, maybe 200 and they would always be for sale uh, posters and uh, I was doing just exactly what I wanted to do and as the artists came in and bought their posters I would invite them to come and, and go through the shop, go through the process with me uh, of preparing and printing their posters so they would know how much time that it took and how much work there was involved in, in producing a uh, a poster. And so I actually taught many of the artists in the Berkeley area how to uh, print a poster and in return they taught me uh, about crank and uh, little cross tops and uh, cocaine and marijuana and I loved it. And I would uh, use the crank to stay up for a couple of days to to do a job, and then uh, I get a bottle of vodka and use it to come down on, and uh, then sleep for a day, and then start it all over again. And it, then I found cocaine and found that it did the same thing for me that crank would do, keep me up, keep me active, and. Um, give me more intelligence than I ever had before. It would allow me to, to speak on subjects I knew nothing about. It uh, made me a great salesperson. And eventually I got uh, uh, connected with the artist who was doing the Grateful Dead posters. And from then on, during the uh, 70s. I printed all the Grateful Dead posters and I printed them for uh, a premium amount of cash and a premium amount of cocaine. Uh, and it became a, the major thing in my life. Not, not the printing of the art posters anymore. And I did so many, so much art that, that I, uh, today I get sick when I think about the posters that I printed that are no longer, that I no longer have. Uh, we printed a, a poster for our shop and it was designed by uh, a guy by the name of Goings, who is the most outstanding poster designer in the United States. And we printed a poster called the Rainbow Zenith lithographer were entrepreneurial even then and when the war broke out the 507 paratrooper infantry and the 187th airborne was stationed in in the town where we grew up a little town of about 6,000 people but all of a sudden it became a town of about 40 to 50,000 and uh, my parents uh, being wise in the ways of the world, opened a bar. And uh, it was called the Officers Club. And they, every night of the week they were at the bar. And during that time, uh, on weekends, they would have my brother and I, who was uh, two years older than I was, we would go down on weekends and, and clean the bar, mop, mop up any uh, spills or blood. Or, and it, uh, uh, the first ones I put up on trees and and then I noticed that people were peeling them down and uh, <laughs> taking them home so I started selling them in the shop and I eventually the, when I sold the last one and I had a contract that this was all we could print and when I sold the last one I sold it for four hundred dollars so uh, And that part of my life was great, wonderful, except for the drugs, except for the alcohol. And eventually, as I say, the printing became unimportant to me. And what became important 
was the getting the drugs. And as the printing became less important, I did less of it and less money coming in. And eventually I got to the point to where I lost my print shop. Uh, I lost uh, everything that I had, including my family. Uh, I moved into a uh, my wife tried to divorce me, but her pastor said, no, you can't divorce him, but you can separate. And separate we did, and I moved into a motel in, uh, on San Pablo Avenue in Emeryville, in the worst possible place I could be. I went to work managing another uh, print shop for an absentee owner. Uh, and I bought drugs, and I, on occasion, sold drugs, and I used drugs. And I remember buying three and a half grams of cocaine once with the idea of uh, selling three grams and getting a half gram free, and I thought, boy, that's great, I can do that, you know. I'm, and then snorting the whole three and a half grams, or smoking it. Um, and that's the way it went. Day-to-day um, -day drugs. Day-to-day. -day. Do I have enough money? Do I have enough drugs? Do I have enough alcohol? Do I have mostly the money? One night after a party at uh, my room, everybody was gone, and. Uh, I undressed and sat on the side of the bed and thought, well, what, have I got enough money for drugs tomorrow? And I reached down and got my bill pulled out of my, my pocket and, and looked and I had three $20 bills. I'd gone to the bank that day and uh, they had given me three brand new $20 bills. They were just crisp and new, no wrinkles. and. Uh, I got to sitting there holding them in my hand, knowing that they weren't going to be enough to, to get me through the day. Uh, a gram of cocaine at that time cost anywhere from a hundred to uh, a hundred and fifty dollars, and I was uh, using at least a gram a day, at the very least. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to do something, and I sat there with that money and my hand and thinking of the accounts that I had that I could get money from and uh, I looked at those twenties and this is a lousy print job. Uh, even though they were new and in sequence, they were different colors. Uh, they were cut off center. Uh, just a lousy job. And I thought to myself, I could do better than this. And somewhere a light went off, the wrong kind of light. And I put my pants on, my shirt, slipped on a jacket, went down to the shop, and put those $20 bills on a camera and began to photograph. And uh, this was uh, a two or three month period that I worked on the negatives and um, and I made some plates and the plates were good and I hid them and knew that then I need to start working on the paper, supply of the paper and I knew uh, paper fairly well being in printing for so long and I knew it was 100% rag and I knew 100% rag was available but the paper that they print currency on has little threads, colored threads in them that is not available. So I needed to devise a way to put those threads in the paper. And I did that. Then I had the problem of working with uh, finding the right ink colors and uh, we didn't have spectrographs in those days where you uh, put in a chip and it'll tell you what color. Uh, so it's a uh, trial and error thing, and finally, 
as I got ready and I was ordering the paper in small lots and ordering them uh, once a week so that because 100% rag has to be recorded. After getting everything ready finally about, uh, it was probably about one o'clock in the morning when I was sure that uh, there was no, uh, I wasn't going to be disturbed. I took the plates and put them on the press and made my first pass. I had enough paper to print $25,000 and I ended up after uh, they went through the quality control part of my uh, operation, uh, I ended up with $17,000. But I carried a couple of them in my billfold. A couple of weeks later on a fishing trip with a bunch of ne'er-do-wells, ne uh, one of them who is a known uh, crook like me, uh, I showed him the bill and he said, uh, thanks, and he put it in his pocket and I said, no, 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 I said, that's one that I made. And he looked at it again with a, a different eye. And he said, uh, oh my gosh, words to that effect. He said, could, can you give me some more of these? You give them to me, I'll pass them. We'll split 50-50. And uh, I told him I had some more. So he took the bills and he passed them. He passed uh, seventeen thousand dollars worth of bills in about uh, maybe a month. Uh, I got uh, eight thousand dollars from it, which I put in my nose and uh, I drank. Then, uh, why he was out passing the bills and he passed them at every ballpark in the United States and Canada. He was a baseball freak and every uh, concession stand, uh, he passed all the bills and why he was passing the bills and I was high on coke every night and every day, I found some more paper and I printed another $5,000 with the $20 bills. And I gave him an additional $5,000 which I consequently put up my nose uh, and by that time into my veins and I was smoking cocaine and it, it goes extremely, extremely fast. So he came uh, to me when he had run out and he said that he had gotten a friend to help him uh, pass the bills. and. This friend of his as well, he was a, a, a owner of a bar, part owner of a bar, and he said that he had a, a cousin who had a bank in Florida that was a drug cartel bank, and that uh, he had shown his friend who showed his cousin one of my 20s and his cousin at the bank said, listen, you get me a million dollars worth of, of $20 bills in this condition and I'll send them into the mint to be shredded and that will re release a million dollars of actual cash and for that I'll give you $500,000 and um, so my friend said they would split $250,000 and give me $250,000 to produce a million dollars worth of bills. You know, for, I had been uh, high on cocaine for about two months, never sleeping long enough to come completely out from under uh, the cocaine. So. I, my mind was gone, so when he told me the story, I thought, 
Well, that sounds perfectly logical. <laughs> I did say no for a while, but I agreed because of the difficulty in doing it. And, but as I began to run out of money and run towards the end of my cocaine stack, I uh, started considering it and then I finally agreed to do it. And uh, the next six weeks were spent in acquiring paper, uh, setting aside time, giving employees time off so that I'd have time because uh, it does take a, 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 at those uh, during those days it took a bunch of time to produce it. So it was a difficult time, paranoid time and and the drugs made it worse. But anyway, I printed the money and uh, put it in the trunk of my car. And one morning, when I had finished the last batch, uh, I called my contact and he and I uh, met in San Bruno and drove out to the airport and uh, put the, uh, as we were instructed to do, put the, uh, the bills, the one million dollars in a locker at the airport. Uh, I dropped him off in San Bruno and went back to work and there was a phone call f there f uh, from my wife and we hadn't uh, probably hadn't seen each other in um, three weeks. So I got on the phone and I said, uh, yeah, and she says, uh, Dick, I'd like for you to come over this afternoon. I tried to get in touch with you earlier, but you weren't there. And I'd like to have you come over and I'm going to fry some chicken and I've invited the kids all over. We need to talk about our situation. And I, high on cocaine and, and knowing that all my troubles were over because uh, I had $250,000 that they were going to give me as soon as they picked up the uh, bills. Uh, I said, sure, sure, I'll come over. Maybe we can get back together. Uh, knowing that, uh, uh, knowing nothing, and my brain was so messed up. Uh, there's no way anybody, anybody could ever live with me. You know? So I got in my car and drove to uh, my house in Pleasant Hill. As I got off the off-ramp and drove down my street. I noticed that there were three cars behind me and I, I didn't think anything about it. Uh, but then when I turned on my street, uh, two of the cars followed me and one of them went up the street a block and I saw him turn also. And as I turned on my street, I saw the two behind me and they both had two men each in the front seat and uh, both of them in suits, or all four of them in suits. I think they were driving Crown Royals. And I thought, this may be it. Uh, this may be uh, the result of my printing. But I thought to myself, as astute as, as I was, I thought, if you do the crime, you better be ready to do the time. And I thought, uh, this doesn't worry me. If that's the way it is, that's the way it is. I pulled in my driveway and boy, there were other cars in a second, guns out, dragging me out of my car and laying me face down on the, on the lawn in front of my wife who was in the kitchen window watching and my kids who came out on the porch. My neighbors that were home, the, the women watching as I was arrested. Um, I found out later that the uh, my friend's friend who had a cousin in uh, 
Florida. That cousin also had a part-time job, the one with the bank. Uh, bank of business evidently wasn't too good because he had a part-time job working for the Secret Service. And the Secret Service was able to do the one thing in my life that could save my life. I didn't realize it at the time. I thought of it uh, several times during the next few days as a, a death sentence, in the next few months as a death sentence. And, but when in reality, uh, it was a time where uh, my life was being saved. And, uh, the garage at the Federal Building is underneath. I still remember driving underneath, uh, uh, getting in my I guess, with handcuffs on, handcuffed behind my back, and I remember saying, "Can you loosen these?" And uh, them saying, "No." <laughs> but I remember getting out of the car, uh, halfway defiant, and. Uh, walking over to the elevators and going up to whatever floor it was that the Secret Service had their offices. And, uh, I've since learned to love those guys, but at that time I was, uh, as they pushed me through doors and pulled me and uh, told me to pick up my feet, took me in a room and uh, had a desk in it and a couple of chairs and they set me in a chair with uh, arms on it and they put my arms underneath the arms and underneath uh, the chair and they handcuffed me very tightly underneath the chair and, and pulled me down so that I, if I I tried to straighten up uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I couldn't do it, you know, and it was constant pressure pulling on my arms and uh, my hands, I felt, were bleeding in my wrists from the handcuffs, which they weren't. But, um, anyway, they began to question me about who it was that, that helped me do the pr printing and producing and the uh, passing of the bills and they knew each time they told me they had me on three counts and they told me that uh, you know the maximum penalty is is 15 years on each count that's 45 years of maximum penalty and they told me uh, that if I would share with them the names of the, the people that that helped me they'd uh, go easy on me and uh, as we walked in the in the building in one of the offices that we passed by deliberately the door was open and there was my uh, seller and his friend in the office my seller was handcuffed to a chair and uh, the uh, other guy was sitting on that corner of the desk so uh, I knew that they had everything that they needed, but I wasn't about to tell them anything. I knew that anything that I shared with them was going to get back to uh, my friend. And I knew my friend was probably facing stiffer charges because he was an ex-con and he did carry a gun. And I, I, I wasn't about to, to share with them anything about him. I was probably more afraid of him, of Poker Bill than I was of the Secret Service. But anyway, I refused to share, and and we talked for about probably about 15 minutes, where I said no, 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 and then finally they said uh, we're going to leave you here for about an hour. They left, and I thought, man, I can't sit like this for an hour. And then I thought to myself, I get used to it. The cocaine began to leave my body and my mind began to clear up a little bit and I thought, get used to it. 
it's a movie out that uh, I think it was Jack Nicholson made, As Good As It Gets. But I remember thinking back then that this is as good as it's going to be for you for the rest of your life. So you might just as well enjoy this. And I remember thinking that and then I remember looking at my feet and looking at the floor with my head down, not able to straighten up and, and thinking about all the things in my life that had brought me to this point. And it wasn't just a, a play thing, this was real. And as far as I was concerned at that moment, my life was over. And at that moment, I remember thinking, you've made a terrible mess of your life, Richard, and you have no hope. So, I sat there, looked at my shoes, and came into contact for the first time with my higher power. And I know that everybody has a point in their life. Uh, I think AA calls it a moment of clarity. And I had a moment of clarity. In fact, I had a bunch of moments of clarity. And I looked at my feet and then looked at the floor. As I say, not able to move. And by this time, cramps in my neck. And I begin to say over and over again uh, the three words that I, I believe that my higher power always hears. And when he hears it, I believe he perks up his ears and runs to that point where he hears it. And I begin to say, God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. I knew there was no help for me anyplace else. I knew that only supernatural help uh, could help me. Uh, and what my higher power did that night and uh, subsequently in my life uh, uh, is very vivid to me. They came back, in fact, three of them came back into the room after about, they probably weren't gone over 10 or 15 minutes, but I thought it was an hour or two. But they came back into the room and uh, the two that had handcuffed me there were, uh, the, uh, their boss was with them and their boss said, what are you doing? Uncuff him. What? He's not a common criminal, you know, and just really chewed out these two guys that had given me such a bad time. And then he offered me a cigarette, which I took, and he said, uh, I bet your mouth's dry. Would you like a drink of water? And I said, I'd love it. And he said, do you have to? And so he said, just go out the hall, uh, down the corridor to your right, and there's a water fountain, and next door beyond that's a, a bathroom. Go, go down and take your time, relax, smoke a cigarette. Uh, come back whenever you're ready. Uh, I walked down the corridor and uh, the restroom was right next to the exit door. And I thought, I wonder if I touched that handle, <laughs> what would happen? Because I knew I, I, this was all part of the good cop, bad cop routine that I'd seen on television so many times. So, But anyway, I went back and uh, I wasn't, I, I I did all the things that he said I could do, but I didn't, I wouldn't share with him any names. And so finally that night they let me go home. Uh, when that night, it was about two o'clock in the morning, they took me home. My wife and family were still up. They had been in contact with the Secret Service and they told me that I was going to be able to go home that night and then go back the next day and I went back the next day and then the, the real uh, trauma began, but uh, uh, I got to visit a couple of uh, the less finer establishments, one in uh, San Francisco at the city jail and one 
at the county jail. They asked me if I could afford an attorney and I said no and they said well you can go to the public defender's office but since uh, this was about five days later that I was freed to go, go any place uh, I went to the public defender's office and all the public defenders there were two of them that, that were working on co-conspirators in, in the case and so they didn't have anybody for me and they had to give me an attorney out of the uh, attorney pool and, and my higher power directed a, a man who was uh, a criminal defense attorney who was uh, really good, really great. And he did a whole bunch of things, and we worked out a plan together to, when, when I went to trial, how I would plead not guilty by reason of insanity because of the drugs and the alcohol, and it was a good plea, and he got everybody that knew me in business that I had been straight with and forward with, got them to write letters, went to my wife's church where I had off and on during my sobriety attended. And all the people knew me, and they all wrote letters to the judge. And uh, so my case was built that uh, maybe I'd get uh, some incarceration and maybe some time in a recovery uh, situation, depending on what the judge felt. But at least I had a defense in three or four months that uh, from the uh, the actual arrest till the uh, time of the trial and during that time I, I uh, tried to really get closer to my higher power and I made a bunch of promises to him. I remembered that 45 year sentence I was 50 years old, and I got to adding that together. 45 and 50 is 95. And I knew that there was not much chance that once I went into prison that I'd get out alive, even, even if they gave me 15 years, a third of, of the sentence. Uh, my chances were not too good uh, lasting. And, federal institution that long, but uh, I was willing to uh, uh, let my higher power be in control. So we went on to the day of my trial and I, uh, on the day of, of uh, my trial, I was taking my shower in the morning and uh, my wife's pastor was going to take us over to the trial and then drive Betty home because they felt that I would leave the, the trial in handcuffs uh, to a new home. Uh, so anyway, I, they were waiting for me and I was in the bathroom uh, showering and shaving and uh, doing my things, getting ready and talking to my higher power. And, and I almost clearly heard him say, although I know that I didn't hear any voice, uh, a new person, huh? a new person, but you're going over there today and you're lying. You're saying not guilty when you are guilty. And that stayed in the front of my mind. We got in the car, we drove to San Francisco to the federal building. We went out and went up to the courthouse and went through the uh, metal detectors and went into the courtroom. My two friends uh, that were involved with me had already been sentenced uh, to five years apiece uh, in federal. And my attorney said, Dick, they got five years. You will probably get 15, but maybe, maybe 10. And all that time is not going to be in federal custody. You're probably going to get sentenced to some time in a recovery house. Uh, 
unit type thing. But he told me all this and and I didn't tell him about the conversation that I'd had with my higher power. So when the judge came in and sat down and they read the charges, uh, uh, they had me stand up, my attorney with me, and read the charges and asked me if I understood the charges that were read against me. I said yes. And he says, uh, how do you plead? And I said, guilty, Your Honor. My attorney said, no, you mean not guilty to me. And I said, uh, guilty, Your Honor. And that was the first my attorney heard of it, the first the judge heard of it, who was all set to hold the trial over and get a jury trial for me. Uh, both of them got perturbed and angry with me. Uh, and the judge, uh, my attorney kept saying to the judge, well, I tried to talk to him, but he, he won't listen to me. Um, did you read the letter? Um, did, did you notice that, uh, um, did you see the psychiatric report? Did you? And the judge kept telling him to shut up. And finally the judge said, if you say one more word, I'm going to hold you in contempt. And there was silence that then, uh, silence that was deafening and I was just saying to myself, get on with it, go ahead, get on with it. But I had a peace. Maybe we sometimes when we face things that are more than we can understand, maybe oh, we withdraw to a place that, that uh, our higher power prepares for us. But I, I had a peace at that time. And the judge said to me, and I remember his words, I remember a phrase that he used exactly. First he said, I have no recourse. You, And then he said, you've left me no wiggle room. And uh, I didn't feel a sense of doom. I just felt I can do this, whatever it is. This is my uh, my life, this is real, and I can do it. He said, I sentence you to five years. And I thought, oh, thank you, God. Anybody can do five years. I'll be out three years. I can rebuild my life. I can do something. I can, I can get this in the past, where it'll be in the past and not something I'm living with. Uh, thank you, God. And I remember all those things going through my mind and him saying then to be spent on probation. And I remember looking at him in unbelief and then I remember thinking, oh my. Oh my God. He then got all flustered. He gave me a bunch of, of community service work to do. I don't even know how much he gave me. Because from that moment on, I was a community service worker for the rest of my life. Uh, he told me I had to make some restitution, uh, which I was happy to do. He had given me, under the direction of my higher power, had given me life. I walked out of the courtroom reasonably free man. My attorney was with me and I stood on the steps of the courthouse and lifted my hands up and said, thank you, God. My attorney next to me said, you got that right. He said, I have never, 
I, in all my days, I haven't seen anything like that. He said, I'm going to advise all my clients, plead guilty. Um, I don't know whether he did, but he was a good attorney and a good man. And uh, He said, I don't know why you did that. And I said, my higher power, that's the advice that he gave me. And he just shook his head. We had some papers to sign at his office and, and we came home and I determined that I was going to be a different person. I also knew that I had a terrible craving for the drug at that time and for alcohol. Uh, the thoughts that go through my mind, you can drink now. You could go down now and get a bottle and it would bring you peace. I, one of the things that I had done, I had started attending a few AA meetings and uh, under the advice of my attorney to show the judge that I'm really working on my life. And, and I, I determined I'd make 90 meetings in 90 days and I did better than that. Wherever I could find a meeting, I went. Um, and I re received a lot of help and I understood that what had happened uh, according to AA I had come to a point in my life where I was powerless and all of us need to come to that point whether we were an alcoholic or an addict. I had come to believe that there was a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity and I, I know today you have to come to that point or you're never going to find sanity. Sanity isn't going to come. You may get sober. But serenity is what you need. Um, and then I made a decision, and I don't know whether it was in the handcuff to that chair or whether it was later as I got home. But I made a decision to turn my own my life over to the care of God, as I understand Him. And I understand Him to be my higher power. And uh, I went to a lot of AA meetings, and I noticed some some things about AA that uh, bothered me. Not the program, not the people, but the fact that in the AA meetings there were no, no people that I knew from the church, that I knew were alcoholics, that I knew spent a week drinking and, and then came to church on Sunday. None of them in any of the meetings and I knew the churches were full of, of alcoholics like me who all my life I'd been a binge drinker. I'd drink for a while and then sober up for a while and go to church and then I'd back out of church and, uh, and it was the same old thing over and over and over again. And I knew the churches were full of people just like me. Uh, so as I talked to, to uh, my higher power about it, he seemed to indicate that I needed a uh, meeting where uh, the spiritual side of the steps would be revealed more. And I, so I looked and I, I looked in churches and there none of the churches had uh, spiritual 12-step meetings. They had AA in the church, but that was it. All the church, none of the churches had uh, meetings of their own. So anyway, I, one day I heard about a meeting and in, in uh, that was a lecture uh, from a Christian AA standpoint, and I went to that meeting. Uh, it was called uh, New Wine, and the guy that uh, ran up just stood up and, and lectured for an hour about the, the, the steps and the Bible and about how they interwove. And so I went back the second night and sat next to the same guy I sat next to on the first night. And we got to talking and he said, boy, I want to start a meeting in my church that the church people can come to. And I said, you know, I think that's what God has been telling me to do. And so uh, that night after the meeting, we 
decided to start meetings in our own churches and call them New Wine. And we did that. He started his in the little church in Antioch, and I started mine in the church in Pacheco here, where I still am. Um, we decided that we'd have an AA-type meeting, but each step that we'd go through, we'd tie to, to Scripture. And we found that the Scripture is full of, of verses that say the 12 steps. Uh, for instance, uh, Step one says, I admitted I was powerless over alcohol or over my addiction, and my life has become unmanageable. And Paul wrote, we felt we were doomed to die when we saw how powerless we were, but that was good, for only then could we turn everything over to the hands of God, who alone could save us. And I thought, the first time I read that, man, I remember that moment handcuffed to that chair, doomed to die. And every step has that tie-in to the Bible, which was written uh, probably 2,000 years before the steps uh, were put down. And uh, uh, so we started meetings. I think my higher power wanted to make sure that I was um, serious and it took a while but they took hold we were thinking about branching out to other churches and and so we sat down one one day one i think it was a tuesday uh, both of us took off work and our wives and we got the bank of telephones at the church and and we called every church in the east bay area and asked them if they would like to have a spiritual 12-step meeting in their church. And many of them said, well, we have AA, we're, we have NA. None of them were willing to uh, start a meeting or to have someone come and start a meeting for their church. So, um, and that was 25 years ago. Today, you go to church, go into any town and call any church and they'll direct you to a spiritual 12-step meeting uh, that is put on by it by the churches the churches know that anyone who really really gets into the 12 steps of AA will come come out with a relationship with uh, God and new wine was uh, under the direction of my higher power what are you going to do now that you're sober? What are you going to do to help others? The court says that's community service. Uh, God says that's what I want from everyone. What are you going to do to help your brother? Uh, so uh, that's the way New Wine began. And uh, Malcolm, my buddy, my, my friend who's in Washington now running a New Wine meeting there, but he went on a uh, mission trip and he went to as far away as Russia. And in Russia, with a uh, female prostitute, they began a new wine meeting, which I'm confident that not only it's going today, and the, and the reason I have that confidence is because my God told me one time in prayer when I talked to him and told him that maybe I was getting ahead of him. He had me read from my memory uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, uh, all of the world, the addict and the alcoholic. Uh, a friend of mine says, the junkie and the drunk. And he wants a ministry in the churches for all of them. And so I know that ministry in Russia is still going, and perhaps maybe 10 or 12 of them are going. Uh, a man left our meeting at Pacheco and moved to Hawaii and started a meeting there. There's a meeting a pastor friend started in Florida 
uh, there's meetings all over. Uh, if there's not a meeting in your area, I know a guy you can call. Uh, you can call 925-687-3635 and someone will get back to you or get to you right then and direct you how to start a meeting or will come to your church and be begin a meeting for you. Uh, there are a lot of meetings. Uh, some of them uh, celebrate recovery is a monstrous meeting and, and you have to be a monstrous church to have it. Mine, if you have five people in your congregation and one of them's an alcoholic, you need a 12-step uh, spiritual meeting and New Wine would be glad to help you. If you need a New Wine meeting, get in touch with us. We're eager, we're ready, and we're, we're able to bring to you the, the same recovery that Christ brought to us. Thank you. Um, so, well, that's my story um, from a 14-year-old alcoholic to a 77-year-old uh, man convinced that his higher power is totally in control of his life. Uh, I hope uh, I hope it might help you. I would urge you, if you haven't already done so, make a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God. Thank you. Thanks be to God, who leads us in His triumph. Thanks be to God, who's got the victory.